too much about the questions. Right, we are now live with Athena Brensberger after a few technical issues, but we finally managed to resolve them on my side. And we'd like to welcome you to this hangout. And, and just to let you know that this hangout is in um, celebration of the Humans to Mars Summit, which I believe you'll be presenting at uh, on the from the 8th to the 10th of May. Is that correct? Yep, I will be there. Uh, well, I'll be there virtually on the 10th for their social media panel. Awesome, awesome. So what, what I'd sort of make sure of is that um, we, we first need to establish exactly who you are and where you fit into everything. And then we're going to try and work out uh, what it is that you're going to be doing at the Humans to Mars Summit. And there are many aspects to you that we want to unpack. We know that, for example, <laughs> are a scientist we know that you are a model we know that you are a social media influencer and and all three things deserve some some time to be spent unpacking so we'll start off with the science aspect when did it all begin for you i was 12 years old my best friend gave me a book on the cosmos and I don't remember the title of it. Uh, I believe actually it was um, by an Indian author uh, because my best friend is Indian. And um, I remember looking at this thinking there were art pieces. I thought there were paintings and I was like, wow, look at this. And she's like, just so you know, like these are things called nebulae and galaxies and they're like millions of light years away. And at that moment, just like I had this internal brain explosion of wait a second, how come I haven't learned about this yet? And is that what explains like what the sky is when I look up at night and when I see all the stars. And at that moment, I was like, this is the ultimate job. I have to do this one day. I got to study the cosmos. And so that's where it really began. Um, it continued throughout high school where I was fortunate enough that my high school, the only school I actually got into, because it was like an audition basis because I was involved in theater and music and dance at the time. So I was auditioning for a lot of schools. And the school I actually got into for vocal ended up having a planetarium, the only high school in Brooklyn that had a planetarium. I'm like, what are the chances of that? So by right? <laughs> so it was, oh, it was so fantastic. I couldn't believe it. Um, but we weren't allowed to take an astronomy class until um, junior year. And I understand it's just, we had to have the mathematics base to kind of build up um, our knowledge base. And so by 16, I started to learn how to track asteroids. And it was on those big like box computers, like those old school <laughs> computers. And it was, it was really fun. Um, and then that continued into college, where also something similar, the only college I actually ended up getting into um, was known as the College of Staten Island. It's a CUNY college, and CUNY stands for City University of New York. And they're part of the public school system for universities, um, as opposed to private universities. And um, this was the only City University of New York uh, campus that had an observatory. So I first started learning how to like look through an H alpha filter and track sunspots. And it, it just continued for me. And that's when I first started majoring in astrophysics. Um, my school actually had, I was a physics major and a minor in astrophysics and then split with theater and a minor in dance. And um, it was so cool. And then that summer when I took my first astronomy course is where I met my professor, Dr. Liu, who became my mentor and said to me, hey, what are you doing this summer? Um, you have like a lot of knowledge base in the subject matter and you love this stuff. I have an internship at the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. Would you like to come and do research? So that's where I first started uh, my, my years of research um, in the field of astrophysics. And that was just, oh man, like it, it was just such a crazy, co like to me it was such a sequence of coincidences, but then that's also made me reflect on life and see, wow, you know, things really are meant to happen the way that they're supposed to, whether or not you you feel you're ready for it or not. Cause I come from a background where my math was bad. Like I was horrible at math, but if you keep pushing yourself and pushing yourself and it's really through repetition, eventually you gain that knowledge and understanding of the logic behind math and science, then that's when you can really excel forward. And yeah, and you just gotta push yourself. So that's what ended up happening for me. So then you technically are, I mean, what did you end up with? Did you finish off a degree in physics? I actually did not, no. So in the middle of getting my degree, um, I got scouted for America's Next Top Model. And um, I was also in the middle of my research, I was studying brown dwarfs. And so that was really cool. And um, 
in the middle of doing that, while I was interning at um, the Hayden Planetarium, I was also working part-time at Aeropostal in Times Square. And that's when I got scouted for America's Next Top Model. And at that time, I was like, I don't know if I really should do this. Like, I want to continue with my science career. Um, but I ended up speaking with my mentors. And I was like, you know, I think that I'm being pulled into an artistic direction um, while at the same time being pulled into my science direction. And essentially what we concluded upon was that school and university is always going to be there. I can go back whenever I want. An opportunity like this is not always going to be there as far as like, going through into um, not just modeling, but also the acting industry. And I always loved it. And so I ended up saying, you know what, let me do a trial and error, take off a semester, see if it works out. If it doesn't, go back to school. I was, I was still like ready to be back enrolled. And um, things ended up working out and I ended up traveling for about seven years. So now here I am getting back enrolled, uh, studying online at universities, while at the same time pursuing a full-time career in, in modeling and acting and then the astronomy influencer, which we'll talk about later. <laughs> okay, but now the, the fascinating thing is that, you know, a lot of people, when they think about modeling, they, there's a certain stigma attached to uh, the way they perceive models. And mm. for example, uh, in, in previous years, when it comes to modeling competitions and, and talent searches, where they're looking for America's top model, they are trying to find role models within the modeling career, uh, industry that would show to young women that you can be a scientist, you can be, but in the past, it was never like that before. Have you mm -hmm. seen those sorts of changes happening in front of you? Oh yeah, there's um, not even just personally with myself, but observing from like a third perspective, other people and seeing their influences being brought onto the world. Um, I, I've been really blown away with actually recent like jobs that I will be working like on set for a commercial or whatever it is. And I will just start talking with people and they come from a background in engineering or in psychology or in like maybe something totally not science related, but like in um, politics. and. And it's really fascinating to me where that just goes to show that, um, you know, in, in, a, in a sense, it doesn't make me necessarily special that I have these two um, different things going on. It's that we all have maybe more of a complex uh, way of living. We have a more complex like brain than a lot of us think. We think that it's either this or it's that. And like, you're either a scientist and you have no creative creativity, which essentially science is creativity. So a lot of astronomy started as philosophy. It came from great thinkers and it came from inspiration of art. And so I think that um, a lot of times people think it's so segregated when really it's actually integrated. And I think that that's something that I think is great that I'm observing a lot, not just in you know the fashion industry, but in science and in just everything in general and all the different subjects. So I do see that quite a lot, um, quite, quite a lot of merging of, of different cultures and different backgrounds um, and, and different like passions and subject matter. Wow. So um, from, from the, the work that I've done with people in, in the uh, entertainment industry, um there there seems to be this notion that if you live in the states and you want to be an actor you have to be a dancer you have to be a singer you have to be an actress you have to have multiple skills uh in order to be scouted and 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 and, and make those auditions is is that still true today or, or or is that just perhaps only in in la and maybe a little bit in new york well, I think it's beneficial to have multiple other talents and it really just has to do with who the person is and what they're passionate about. I feel like if you're very passionate about theatrics and acting and stage acting and doing really old school plays like by Shakespeare, and um, I think that when it comes to that artistic form, if you're not interested in the musical aspect or the, the, uh, the dancing aspect, then if you start getting yourself involved in it, it's really going to just be half of your heart involved. And so in the end, you're actually taking yourself away from what you really are passionate about. So I think that when it comes to that, yes, it is beneficial to have a lot of extra um, talents under your, under your belt, because this way you can, you, know, you can increase your likelihood of booking external jobs, other types of jobs, dancing jobs, singing jobs, but I would say it really is up to the person because I've met people that are like phenomenal actors, phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal actors, and they will spend all their time working on their craft in specifically only acting. And they 
um, don't spend too much time like doing dancing. Maybe they'll learn a little bit or singing um, or even getting involved in anything else. But um, as long as they focus on that one craft, they're good. So it, I think it really just comes with a specifically who the creative is and recognizing what their talents are. And New York is totally different than LA. So now I live in LA and, <laughs> and um, I mean, I love it because it's like, I mean, today's raining, but like it's warm weather. It's really cool. Um, but New York, I've noticed as far as they still have television, film, and all that other stuff. Um, but I think the reason why people say if you live in the States and you want to pursue that career, go to New York or LA, it's just because throughout time, throughout decades, that's really where the industry grew. So it's just, you know, just what it, what it really is. I mean, there's places that are shooting in Atlanta. There's e-commerce, where which is like online catalogs for like JCPenney that shoot in Massachusetts. Like there's, there's industry everywhere. Um, and even, oh my gosh, in other countries too, especially, oh, South Africa, Cape Town. Like I have friends that live there right now and they're on contracts. So all over the world, there, there really is. I think it's a matter of recognizing who you are and maybe what your market would be in as, as a talent or a creative. Okay. Um, look, the, uh, the industry is, is evolving and, and, you know, originally it was magazines and billboards and, and now we're moving into a, a more digital uh, environment where it's more about Instagram and, and, and Facebook and, and Twitter. So, so are, are you part of that revolution? Um, are you seeing that there's less work for the magazine covers and, and ads, or, or they, they still doing the same work, but now they're just putting it into a digital format? There definitely is still a lot of work for like ma magazines and also physical ads billboards, um, because I think at the end of the day, like that's still, in a sense, reality, not that social media is not a reality, but we physically see it while we're walking down the street, as opposed to we need to have a phone that's turned on in order to view the ad. So if our phone crashes, we don't see the ad, that's not really reality anymore. So I think um, the industry is definitely changing a lot and there is a lot with Instagram. Um, I mean, anytime now I go to an audition or even meeting with an agency, it is just protocol now to ask like how many followers you have and what your Instagram is and like what's the the image you're really pushing for yourself and who you want to show the world that you are. So it it definitely is a big transformation. Um, I think it's cool because essentially like it is media, it's social media, but it's still a sense of media. And so it's still a sense of advertising and a lot of clients and a lot of, of industries um, or a lot of companies in the industry are using social media to actually promote their brands um, or even like promote their fashion shows. So um, it definitely is transforming a lot, even then to like a lot of agencies um, are signing influencers that, you know, you look at maybe back in the nineties or the early two thousands um, might've not really, people wouldn't have seen them as like the, you know, quote unquote model type, but because of this evolution also, because we're starting to recognize, I think the entire human race as, as beauty. There's less um, segregation between what is the classical beauty like framework. And now it's kind of like beauty in all different aspects, like this movement of healthy, like being healthy. And like, that's really um, like the new like style. That's the new like magazine cover is like being healthy, body conscious, like loving yourself. And, and um, I think that social media has really aided in that because that regardless you look at the youth they're the ones who are viewing social media the most and so because of this um they're the ones who are going to be innovating they're the ones who are going to be creating the next companies the next industries like everything that's up and coming and so current fashion market and industries are recognizing that and i think that's why they're taking a big notion into moving into uh social media as opposed to just like physical print catalog i mean i don't really see catalogs that much anymore even when i get the victoria's secret catalog in the mail it's like this big it's like two pages and it's just kind of like oh this is what a snippet of our collection is go online to check it all out and um yeah and i don't think it's bad in a, at all i think it's just sort of the next evolution of the human race and and our, our evolutionary stage wow yeah. um what about and i'm gonna ask some tough questions too <laughs> um <That's okay. laughs> these, are the easy ones. these are the soft ones um <laughs> things i want to address is obviously uh being a role model um it's very important for young women to to look up to um whatever they see in magazines or on Instagram and think that is who I aspire to look like. But digitally, many of the people don't actually look like that in real life. 
with mm -hmm. Photoshop, people are enhanced uh, with magazines. And, and I mean, with a simple cell phone, uh, there's a beautify aspect that you can slide along and, and, and change your appearance. And, and many of the social influences are also taking 30 or 40 shots to get the right shot to portray this idyllic life, but it's not really always like that. What is your take on that? So I feel like I've, I've seen this quite a lot and um, I can't say that I'm trying to fight the status quo because a lot of my photos that I have from shoots, they are retouched. There are edits on there. They want to brighten the background. They want to brighten my green eyes, like what, whatever it is, you know? So a lot of these things are retouched. Um, and I feel like um, there's a, uh, it, it's almost as if, um, there's like this fine line between having a good balance of showing what reality is and showing what you truly are and then showing what um, like the reverse showing what you know you look like being edited being in the industry now that's that's a different realm that's industry that's fashion that's like for magazines then you have what you said where people will take somewhere around 50 pictures in order to upload on their their Instagram um, I personally understand how we each all have our own self-consciousness and so sometimes we'll take a picture and we're like that's a horrible angle like i don't like that area like let's do another one so it's still like it's always been like that through human nature um i mean even going back to the 1800s with like corsets on women like it always we've always wanted to restructure the way that we look and and, and even with men too like um having like a, a certain mustache twirl or, or powdering their hair and actually in like also the, the 1800s having the wigs with the curls on it um and then when the wig falls off you're embarrassed because you're bald and like so we as humans we've always felt the need to adjust the way we looked according to what the social image is at the time so part of me i don't get ultimately frustrated about it just because we are all sensitive beings essentially at the end of the day but i do think it's really important that there is a lot of this movement that i'm seeing where people like there was a dove commercial where they say like this is what like i look like and there was like different women and um uh i think they were like wearing like a sports like workout gear and like a sports bra and stuff and and that really helped so many people say wow you know what i love my body because other people look like that and so i think that when you have like social media influencers at the end of the day everyone knows that they're retouched everyone knows that there that there has been something adjusted um because everybody knows about facetune everybody knows about a lot of these um these apps that like you said the beautifying app so i don't have a very like aggressive point of view where i'm like this is wrong we should change it because no matter what people are still going to do that um, whether or not we want to change that or not. But what I like is that there's a huge increase in those that are actually trying to bring the message of this is what we actually all look like at the end of the day. And we all are starting to have wrinkles or like, you know, we sag, whatever it is, you know, like men and women, it's, it's, it's genderless, you know, we all are aging. And um, I have actually noticed this, and this is sort of a random side thing, is that um, I was talking to my friend about it and I was like, you know, there hasn't been as much discussion i think with um like the male physique or like the, the like as far as um i know like there's been a lot about women and women con and body consciousness um which i 100 percent you know agree with and i think that it's good to, to discuss that but i noticed there isn't as much um discussion about men and we all have insecurities at the end of the day um men and women so i think it's interesting just to kind of notice that there hasn't been so much talk about that because the same thing in modeling like i know so many models males and women and females that go through uh body conscious issues um whether like you're not skinny enough or you're not bulk enough you know and and every single one goes through it um males and females so i thought that was interesting but at the end of the day i think it is important that influencers will upload stuff and say like hey this is who i really am and you know maybe some of the pictures were a bit touched but it, it's a lot asking for people because a lot of people don't have the courage to do that because at the end of the day, a lot of people are self-conscious and will be until I don't know what age. <laughs> so that's kind of my overall take um, on it. Yeah. <laughs> Coming from it, it makes sense to me. Um, I mean, look, if, if I'm a, um, a magazine and I'm advertising a toothpaste, um, you can understand why they might want whiter than white teeth because it certainly adds to the allure of the fact that 
the toothpaste is doing its job. And yeah. and you might, for example, a, a detergent company that wants to make sure that the white shirt that you're wearing is whiter than white. So I, I, I get that. I mean, it, that that part, you know, I, I don't have an issue with because, you know, you know, it's 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 not a case of taking a celebrity and then removing about 30 kilograms from their body and then getting a false impression that that's what they really look like. Because that to me is the extreme where, where, where they go, for example, and some some celebrities have actually called out the magazines on that saying, hold on, I'm quite happy for you to, you know, to remove a, a zit here or there, but but really, I mean, you, you chopped off half my leg. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, I've, I remember hearing that before. I forgot which celebrity it was specifically that spoke out about that. Um, that I think is a totally different thing because that's the 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 media that's doing that without the permission of the artists themselves. Like, um, and so I think that that's really really messed up. I, I, it wasn't until I was like fourteen until I realized that there was such a thing as Photoshop. And I was looking at magazines and I was like, how is your skin so smooth? And like smoothing was always a thing that we, we spoke about. We're like, how is your skin so smooth? They have no blemishes or anything. And then you realize that it, it's a smoothing feature on Photoshop and you're like, what? Um, and so I do think um, that's something really wrong, but I think also that's why a lot of tabloids exist and tabloids are able to get pictures of celebrities when they're like at the pool or whatever it is. And that's why they're probably so popular, like People Magazine and all those other magazines, which I, I personally don't read, but like I know about them. And so uh, I know in there they have a lot of pictures of celebrities exposing this is the true way that they look and everything like as if it's this bad thing and they're supposed to be this perfect image all the time. And it's like, wait a second, this is what's humanizing them. This is what humanizes all of us is the fact that like, this is our, our body. This is how we are like, it, and it's just crazy because like, you know, I want, like I start to think, I'm like, does the animal kingdom worry about this? You know, do the lions and the tigers worry about that? And, and like, they don't, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe they do. Um, looking around, you know, do you think my butt looks big in, in, in this? Uh, I can't imagine it's gonna happen that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be funny, but yeah. So the, um, then, okay, so, so now we're gonna, we, we're gonna move on from, from where you are. You, you're obviously modeling and you mentioned social influencer a lot. What is your definition of a social influencer? So um, uh, the general term I feel of social influencer is more so a per person that is seen as like the, the level just below celebrity. Um, so they're an icon to the general public. People look up to them, people value them, they value what they think, what they say, and uh, how they look because Instagram is images as opposed to so much literature. Um, but they, I think that an influencer is someone also who tries to spread a message of some sort. And um, a lot of influencers are more so about trying to spread the message of themselves. Um, but I think at the end of the day, like sometimes they utilize themselves to help advertise certain brands. Uh, I have noticed this with a lot of um, influencers is that because like uh, they're in great shape and their hair color is perfect, they'll advertise a certain hair brand um, or a tea brand or something. So that I've noticed a lot, which is sort of a typical influencer like brand, like brand stamp. In my eyes, what I'm trying to build up more so is like, I'm trying to build up a community on Instagram, so I know that influencers generally tend to have like uh, a million followers and they'll follow one person or four people because they're trying to put themselves at celebrity status because like uh, Instagram, um, what was it like, like uh, Insta Famous um, was it really became super, super popular. And for me, though, my whole purpose is to spread the word of science and knowledge and astronomy and why we should care and try to find that connection of astronomy and astrophysics within ourselves and within life and why it's so important. Um, and and it, simultaneously, I am doing all my modeling stuff because I have agents that look at my Instagram a lot. Um, and so to me, that's important. But at the same time is I understand the value that it brings by having there be differences on the Instagram itself, um, having the modeling and, and, the, and the, um, the astronomy. But I try to reach out to every single person that starts to follow me to follow them back, to look at their account, to see what they're doing. Because I have met so many amazing people that are 
like either physics students or researchers or their actual physics professors or astronomy or like or their their um people that want to get like their their pilot's license um or even like people in acting or modeling and i just think it's like it, i don't know it's super cool um and i well, think we did we just lose you no we need to have as a bare minimum to be a social influencer do they have like a cutoff line and say sorry 10,000 not really much an influencer or they say 3,000 that's pretty effective i mean do they have a, 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 some sort of measurement so um i believe normally an influencer begins around 50,000 followers so at about 50k i'm at 19 thousand right now so i would be considered a micro influencer and what that means is usually like as you can tell micro it's so it's a smaller um, level of influencer but you still have a reach you still have a good amount of engagements and um so for me i feel like you know the the way that i've actually met i've met a lot of people i like uh, the companies i work with right now i met them through instagram um they just recognize i don't know how they found me or what it was and uh, through a hashtag or something but it really was because of this um, back and forth interaction that I have with a lot of my followers. And I'll try and engage them in conversation or I'll reach out to them and I'll, I'll like share their stuff. And so because of that constant back and forth, that's what builds up your page to be seen more as an, as an influencer rather than um, I guess like a micro influencer. Um, so I've noticed that brands and companies, they don't just look at what your following is because a lot of people had like bots for a while on their page, but um, they also try and look at, um, like, like I said, like how many types, what kind of engagements you actually have on your page, um, and that's what that's normally what the 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 definition would be for for influencer. What does a social media influencer actually do? If, so, if there was a job description, what would you say your job description is as a social media influencer? A social media influencer, is, like I was saying earlier, is usually to try and spread a message of some sort, um, and whether that's through advertising, uh, because a lot of social media influencers team up with brands, and uh, they will use their page because if they have a big following, it's as effective to um, a, a brand to have it go on uh, a social media influencer's account versus a billboard, because maybe that billboard will reach like 200 people a week, but if you reach a, an influencer that has like 2.4 million followers, that's probably gonna reach an average around like uh, maybe 50,000 people a week. And so, um, give or take, maybe it's actually somewhere. Yeah, because no, 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 actually probably around 200,000 because of, a post will usually get around 200,000 um, within a few days for someone who has like a 2.5 million following. Um, but so normally a social media influencer would be around um, really advertising. That's what I've noticed. My goal is to be a social media influencer to actually spread a message. Um, and for me, like I've said, it's, it's about astronomy, it's about astrophysics, it's about like why this is important, why space exploration is important, why we need to get humans to Mars, why we need to you know, go become an interplanetary species, and also the benefits that it has for us on Earth. Um, and I've just learned so much about like, uh, about pretty much like what uh, a lot of the technologies that comes out of NASA that comes out of like the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, I think a lot of us have heard that before. I actually learned when I was at uh, NASA headquarters in Washington, DC, I was with the Planetary Society to talk to Congress about the NASA bill of 2017. And um, they were telling us about how when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, all the images were blurry. And I'm sure you might've heard this if you haven't, it's really cool. And the, the, um, they got all their best computer software engineers to get together and correct the, the blurriness in the images. And through that technology, they were able to apply it into uh, modern day uh, like mammograms so for detection of, of cancer a lot earlier uh, for breast cancer. And um, I thought that was super cool. And that's like a really great way to sort of tie that back down to earth. And it's considered a NASA, a NASA spinoff. Um, so there's like a whole bunch of them that really, uh, like the, the technology has really affected people here on earth. And, for me, there's so much knowledge out there, especially having the internet. And um, my passion is to really try and bring all that, um, try not just for myself, or, like the better learning of myself and actually like understand more that there is out there, but also to try and bring that to other people. And so if I can in any way have like the following that I have, listen to like um, a video that I do on like, 
um, I don't know, like black holes or why it's important for us to study this or Hawking radiation. It's really about trying to tie back into that ultimate question, which is like, where do we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? Uh, ultimate three questions, I guess. So um, I think that with, with social media, it really, I've noticed with social media influencers, it really does uh, change a lot with depending on who is the influencer. Um, and uh, sometimes that some of them are in there just because they wanna do advertising and make money. I mean, sometimes they can make $2,000 a post uh, for like a curling iron or something like that. And, um, and the reason I haven't done that um, is, well, for one, my following isn't like super massive considered to, to those who have like millions of followers. But also um, I feel like if there's anything I'm gonna talk about on my page for an advertisement, it has to be some type of science related for me. And um, I, I just think that that would just, it would like tie it back down to earth. Like anything that can relate uh, like an everyday object to the scientific meaning behind it is what will intrigue people to be into science. Um, and so, cause I, yeah, I think at the end of the day, a lot of us are interested in it, but um, not enough of us actually um, really go for uh, trying to trying to understand it or comprehend it more. Well, it's I mean, different. it's a complicated business. I mean, there are some people, for example, who have YouTube channels who make enough money off their YouTube channels to not have to work. They just have mm -hmm. to bring out a new video every week and, and that keeps them um, financially stable. But the problem is that when they go and do something silly in a foreign country and then they have millions of viewers watch them do something really silly, um, then a lot of people start thinking, well, maybe it's time to move away from some of these social media influence. So there are some people who might ruin it for the industry, but you are dedicated to promoting science. Am I correct in thinking that there's a little bit of geekiness going on with Darth Vader behind you? I'm just taking oh, a yeah. while. <laughs> <laughs> and I have like my collection of Legos, but you can't see it. it's kind of far away. Oh, um, I, can, I can see it. I picked them all up. <laughs> So, well, that's, I have my headphones, so that's effectively i mean you you are do you, you go to comic cons and 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 dress up in your favorite uh sci-fi outfits so i actually haven't done that um i i didn't learn i know i didn't learn about comic con until about uh like four well actually it wasn't that long ago maybe like four or five years ago because my brother used to go a lot but um, my brother was really interested in comic books and anime. And for me, being the younger sister, I was like, I want to be like my brother. And so I never got into any of that stuff. I was into science fiction because to me, that was like, oh my gosh, like Star Trek, everything that they talked about, is like kind of coming true, except for like quantum teleportation and, you know, a lot of other things, Death Star and everything. But um, anyway, well, Star Wars, but um, well, and then you talk about Star Wars separately, totally separate than, than Star Trek. Um, I feel like that has just made such an impact on people. And I think that that um, in itself would just be, um, I don't know. I, I think that all of that is really cool and it, it intrigues a lot of kids, especially to, to want to, um, I don't know, like question like, well, can this be true one day? Can I be the one to create this? Can I be the one to make this a reality, this, this type of technology that's in this movie? Um, but yeah, but me personally, I really, um, like I grew up watching Star Trek a lot, like with my dad, like we still have it recorded on VHS and stuff. Um, and I did used to watch a lot of that, but I, I've never actually, I've always missed all the, the comic cons. I've missed a lot of the things where like I'll dress up and I've never really done cosplay before, um, which is funny because you would think that like, I would that those things go hand in hand. And it's not that I'm not interested. I just have never had the opportunity to like, like I've gone to Six Flags back in New York, like well, in New Jersey. Um, and then I'll, I'll wear like a, a Superman cape because I'm like, oh yeah, like it's Halloween. Like we got to dress up. Let's like dress up like as, as, a, as a cartoon character or a, a superhero, a comic character. And um, yeah, or, um, but yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I just like, I have like, you know, different things. I have geeky things around here, but um what you're really like saying it. is you'll be following your next Instagram post of when you do attend Comic Con and 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 maybe even get to report on on some of the the, the sci-fi stuff that's going on there because from what I can understand you also like to do a little bit of presenting is that correct? Yes, I do. Um, what a, I I I didn't think I was gonna want to do that at first because um, I was always like super awkward and nervous growing up and I used to stutter a lot, but I realized that. As long as I focus on the science and not myself, everything will be okay. And so <laughs> that's really what started with the presenting. Um, I think that with conferences, 
Um, also, probably I haven't gone to Comic Con because it's usually so packed. Like at um, oh, well, the Jacob Javits Center in New York. Like I've been there so many times for like different shows, and it's so crazy packed that I'm like, oh, I don't want to be around this. So that's probably why I haven't gone to Comic Con. Um, but I think that trying to present on something, it's so different because I think that there's still a mass population of people that don't show up to certain lectures or like, I mean, okay, like his lecture sounds boring, you know, but like, if you think about it, like what is the subject matter on and can you be interested enough to like s listen to what they have to say and apply it to your everyday life? And, you know, a lot of science lectures and I'm putting it in quotes because, um, because today science lectures aren't like the traditional lecture anymore. Sometimes they're like fun, they're intriguing, they're interactive, like they're they're about explaining what their their research is on um, in a very scientifically literate way, but at the same time being an being engaging. And that's one thing I've been really um, noticing in scientists, and I honor them so much for this. But a lot of them have gotten these really great. Um, presentation skills and they've got these really great like ways of, of connecting to other people especially those that work with children and, and go to schools and give talks and i think that that's really important and not a lot of people know about that or even like specific events like astronomy on tap or going to like when i was in new york like columbia university to go to the roof and like we would have uh we would, like an astronomy night where we'd all go to the telescope and like look at jupiter and look at saturn and we would talk with scientists earlier in the day about stuff and these are all like free fun events. Um, and Astronomy on Tap was actually, I don't know if you know about it. It's- um, I don't. It's, I don't know if they have it um, anywhere outside of the States, they should, um, but it's, I first went to it in New York. I haven't gone to it yet in, in LA because I think they have it in Pasadena, but um, it's essentially, like on top, so you're normally at a bar, it's for adults, and um, you have an astronomer on stage um, who's usually talking about some type of subject matter in astronomy. And the time I went, they had three comedians, and each comedian had to like deliver um, their actual presentation on some type of subject matter in astronomy. And they would be questioned by the astronomer and the audience would interact. And so anytime you hear the word telescope or you hear the word star, you would like cheers and take a drink, whatever it is. And then we would get called on in the audience saying like, hey, um, like, I don't know the answer to this question that astrophysicist blah, blah, blah is asking me. Does someone from the audience know the answer? And so then the audience participate and it's a bunch of science geeks. So normally like they'll know the answer. And um, and if they don't, then like one of the teams like lose or win in the end. And that's essentially, um, so it's like a big game. It's kind of like who wants to be a millionaire, but it's like who wants to be an astronomer and, but it involves um, normally like drinking beer or something. Uh, uh, which is I like beer. that approach. I mean, I know that they have uh, quite a few initiatives where science communicators will do, uh, they call it science and the pint and 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 bar science and 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 they'll have they'll pick various venues and and people will go science communication is obviously very important because we need to communicate ideas about science um, I'm not going to say who's president and whose country we might be referring to but but there might be certain uh, countries where science denial is is almost uh, slightly embarrassing that that they kind of missed the boat on global warming and, and things like that. But before we get a little bit too political, what I do want to know is, you know, you're obviously going to Humans to Mars Summit and, and there's going to be a lot of discussion about Mars. So my question to you is why Mars? Why should we even go to Mars? Yes. So I think that one, the first reason is um, the pretty obvious one. It's that we haven't been there yet as humans, we've sent such a large number of landers, rovers, um, and even like orbiters to actually observe Mars, look at Mars, look at its atmosphere, look at um, its surface, look at everything on Mars, but there hasn't been any human activity on Mars. Um, we also haven't even been to, to outside of lower Earth orbit, so LEO, um, since uh, the, 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 the lunar landing since the Apollo missions. Um, I believe also that, well, that's for the United States. There's been, um, other countries that have visited, but, um, as far as, you know, I think it's great that we're doing lower, lower earth orbit. We have the international space station. That's super important. I think it's amazing. Um, but I think that going to Mars will do something like 
emotional for the human race. And I, I'm not even talking about scientific. Everyone, I, a lot of people know the scientific reasons we should go. There's a uh, potential for us finding water. There's ways that we can recycle the sands and turn that into water. We can turn it into oxygen. We can like plant crops there. We can actually like start to learn to, to colonize and not just because, you know, not that the earth isn't like, you know, the earth is going through problems. Um, but essentially I believe we will be able to, um, fix our planet, recycle it. Like it, it's, it's very much al alive, our planet. And there's still so much we don't know about our oceans. And I think that we shall continue that and continue the, the earth exploration willist having people on Mars. Also, because you think about it, the human population is increasing so much right now. <laughs> and like there is, that's also what's aiding into the greenhouse effects because you're having more people living, you're having more fossil fuels being burned, but you also have more carbon dioxide being produced from like us every time that we breathe and we're inhaling oxygen, we're exhaling carbon dioxide. And so you're having an increase in human population. And I think that it might be a good idea to also you know, transfer some of the people, not transfer some of the people, but like have some people visit Mars, but also begin to colonize, begin to to look at it as reality. Like as as often as we it is that we can go from like um, New York to Europe, as often it is that we can go from like um, California to Mexico or from like um, San Francisco to, to Korea. Like I'm just trying to think of the closest locations of travels. Um, but, you know, I think that, it, it's so like common sense to us to be taking airplanes and go from point A to point B. And, you know, the early human generation, like a human, early, early human, um, like, uh, sorry, the, the early humans, I'll just say, uh, didn't really see that as um, a possibility. They thought that was so far fetched. Well, who's to say that us going to Mars isn't so far fetched? Like we've already built up the technology that um, will get us there and we're working on it and we're super close to being able to get us there. Um, but also we've already figured out how we actually can start to live there and how to colonize and how to survive there. So that's the scientific reason. But I think going back into the emotional reason, I think that it will just do something for humans that like when we saw the Tesla with, the, with Starman in space did. And a lot of people were like, wow, you know, like I want to see myself in that car. I like, I could see myself doing that. And, and, and it's not just like, you know, the kids that are saying that, because of course, I think a lot of kids that probably saw that and was like, well, like, that's what I want to do. Because how many of us, when we were kids, said we wanted to go to space, we wanted to be an astronaut. And as we get older, we get so worried about that because for one, you think that you can't do it because either you're bad at math or you're bad at science, or the next reason you feel like you can't do it because um, you think that like you're getting older, you, you cherish your life more and you won't want to go to space because you think you might die. And it's just kind of like, well, any like people who've traveled the world um, by boat and they didn't know what was on the other side. They thought the earth was flat and they like ended up going and, and exploring. And it was like for the whole purpose of human exploration. Now, if we already explored the maximum of our planet, why not start to explore another planet? So fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. If, if would you be willing to be one of those first people? If it was a one way trip, I wouldn't want to, cause I would want to come back. Um, I'm definitely going to space. 100%. I mean, I know I'm going to space. Um, I don't know if it's just going to be like low Earth orbit or what. Um, so I would say as far as as far as far going to Mars, if there's a way that I can return back, then I would definitely do that. So hello, Effie. Uh, uh, and if you joined us, I, I'm just going to mute you if that's OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that will work. Uh, Is this OK? No, I'm just muting you if that's OK. Um, and so we've got Govinda and we've got Effie. Uh, Effie's in Greece and Govinda's in Nepal. And we've got a whole bunch of people who are watching it live as well. And, and uh, people who will watch this afterwards as well, who get a sense of the fact that you've managed to successfully combine um, the, the space aspect, the science aspect and the modeling. Uh, Effie is obviously because you notice your name, Athena has Greek connotations. Is there something that you know about? As it, wait, you were breaking up a little bit. You said um, my name, uh, and then I missed what you said after that. The name Athena is obviously Greek. Is yes. is there a Greek connection to your name? So, um, no, I was actually named after a song by The Who. Uh, <laughs> uh, my parents are big fans. But they did also really love the name. There's a lot of um, 
history and power behind the name that I really do like a lot that I think is pretty awesome, the goddess of wisdom and warfare. So I'm like, okay, cool. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not a you know, fighter, but I do think that um, when it comes to warfare, that also means strategy. And I think that that's extremely important. So um, I've actually have been very grateful that my parents named me that because I've been able to apply it to everything in my life, which has been pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so my, my parents just all really, really like the name. And so they decided to name it. Awesome, awesome. So, yeah. so now what, what I'm keen to learn a little bit more about is um, you want to obviously promote science and you want to use your your social media platforms to promote it. How does one grow their social media platform? Uh, because obviously if you're an influencer, you need to have a certain number of people following you. How do you grow that platform to, to promote your message? I interact with everyone. So I really try, okay, I try, it's a little difficult. I can't really say everyone, but I try as much as I can to truly interact with every single person that I start to see on my channel. Um, constantly looking at everyone's comments, constantly writing back to them, checking their page out, looking at what they're doing. Um, like I was mentioning to you earlier, it's beautiful how I meet so many people that are in the scientific field um, that will be following me or even in the fashion field that will be following me and they find inspiration in what I do. And so I'm like, well, that's great. I find inspiration in what you do. And I think that just it's it's a true human connection that a lot of people tend to segregate when they're involved in social media. They start to think like, oh, okay, I'm just behind a computer and I can just like observe. And it's like, well, in real life, would you do that? Would you, If you were saying hi to someone would, when they go to shake your hand, would you just observe them? Like, no. And you would interact with them. You'd want to say hello and get to know them. And um, I'm a very big people person I've learned over the years. And honestly, I think that we all are naturally people, person, people, 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 because um, <laughs> yes, people, people, uh, because honestly, like we're, we were created like, like in the mass numbers, like we have evolved into the mass numbers. There's so many of us, if there wasn't so many of us, then um, why in the world would, would we not connect with each other? Um, and so I think that it's, it's something very valuable to look at. And I think that we're all supposed to live throughout our lives with each other and not so alone and independent. And one thing I've really been liking through social media is, of course, you know, it, be, because you don't know the person personally, you do have to be, you know, a little, little wary of that, you know, when you talk to them. Um, but I think that there still needs to be a, a little sense of openness of like seeing like, huh, you know, why did they come to my page in the first place? Why are they interested in what I'm doing? And let me go up to their page. Let me see what they're doing. And um, through that, just through that interaction, they'll tell friends about me. And then uh, more people come to my page. I'll check their friends out. Their friends will tell other friends. And I really noticed that that's what's really gained up um, the interaction. But I also like to notice when um, when is a good time to post? When people are active, when people are online, like when will they want to see a picture of a galaxy? When will they want to see like um, a video of like the March for Science that I just did recently? You know, it's like, would they want to see it live? Or so it really is, I think, about knowing to um, your community. I don't even want to say like your audience because, like I said, is it's not so much me versus them. It's like me with this person, me with that person, and it really is a community. And I think that that's what's so important about trying to grow the science community because it's there's so many of us, but a lot of us are still trying to find our connections with each other. So that's how I've really been working on that. <laughs> so that you are a niche uh, social uh, so media in, uh, uh, influencer in the science world, science world? Or, or is it? A big, uh, is it it definitely is pretty niche um, because I have noticed um, like just a lot of my friends who actually are in the science world, um, you know, they, they are specifically doing stuff with their science, um, like their science research, they're in, the, they're in a lab or the programming. So I've learned that it is pretty much niche because I haven't met other people that are doing this, um, that are doing stuff that are also involved in um, the art community or I've met quite a few people that are, but not a lot. Um, so I, I would use that term safely. Uh, I would say it's it's pretty niche. I like it. It's pretty cool. I mean, do you find that in order to promote what you do, it would be helpful to to connect with science rock stars and, and get them to promote you so that that way you can elevate uh, from micro influencer to what is the next one? A major influencer? <laughs> I guess a regular influencer. Um, well, yeah, I think I think that would be like you know really cool. Um, I 
I'm not so persistent with like reaching out to people saying like, hey, would you give me a shout out? Because I feel a little weird doing that. I just, I, I'm, I, it makes sense to do that. Of course, there's a lot of logic behind doing that. Um, but if I'm going to reach out to someone, I don't want it to just be a, a take. I want it to be a give and take. I want to be able to exchange a moment with them. I want to be able to like collaborate on something that's meaningful to both of us, to mutual parties. Um, so I feel like the only times that I have actually reached out to um, anyone really online, it's been just kind of like, I love what you're doing and you're in this area, I'm in this area, let's meet up for coffee and like brainstorm on something. And um, I haven't really collaborated too much. I've collaborated with a few people. I've collaborated with big like um, like companies, which has been really cool. Um, and then that's how I ended up hosting for a few different shows that I'm, I'm hosting on. But as far as actually reaching out to like an influencer and saying, hey, can you give me a shout out? I haven't done that yet. Um, and I think if I if I were to do it, it wouldn't really I wouldn't go about that way. Just saying, hey, can you give me a shout out? I would reach out to them and say, hey, I have this really cool topic that I want to talk about, and I think that you would be great to talk about it with me. And I just haven't done that yet, but I think that's a really good idea, and I should probably do that this afternoon. What, what about <laughs> tomorrow's summit? Do you geek out when you get there, and then you've got all these space celebs there? Uh, I know that they're going to have the new administrator. Jim, uh, who's just been made the new administrator at NASA. There are going to be many astronauts. Uh, how do you feel about going to a platform like that where you appreciate the science and you appreciate the space aspect of it, and now you've got all these people who are not even social media influencers. They are the people that you look up to. I mean, how, how do you think you're going to handle that? Yeah, so I would probably handle it like how I have in the past. Um, like for instance, when I met Katie Coleman at a, it was a space entrepreneurship meeting in New York. And um, I, she was pretty bombarded with a lot of people around her, of course, as you know, she should be Katie Coleman. And um, essentially I ended up going up to her once everyone kind of like sizzled out and um, was just talking to her one-on-one -on -one, like, you know, this is so cool. Like um, I'm sure you get asked these questions quite a lot about just, you know, what it's like being in space and what it's like, you know, how to really decide whether you want to be an astronaut and how to, it's a big life decision. And I think that it's trying to understand the person as if you were in their shoes, as opposed to, um, of course, I think we should, we all look up to them, but I think there's, there's a big differentiation between like when we like worship a celebrity versus like wanting to talk with them like a regular person and wanting to talk with them like a human because they are human. So anytime, of course, I get super nervous before I talk with them. Like I'm not totally just like, oh, okay, whatever. You're just, you know, you want space, whatever. But like, you know, actually talking with them. And like I met with Mike Massimino at um, the Intrepid in New York City also because I was volunteering there. And, and it's just, they just enjoy talking with people. And of course they did amazing things. And so when they do get asked it, they, they truly love talking about it. And so I think it's just about having that good human connection. Um, uh, as much as I would like to record all of it, I, I respect them and I'm not just kind of like, here's my camera in your face, let's record something. Um, so I usually like to kind of ask them first, like, would you mind if I were to get a picture or a quick video with you for 10 seconds or 15 seconds for my followers? Um, because I love what you do and they absolutely love what you do too. And you know, they love to hear a message from you. So I think that's a good way to go about it. And that's normally how I handle it. Um, because again, like, you, you know, uh, no one really wants to experience like a fangirl running up to them and, and obsessing and freaking out. And it, although it's, it may be flattering to some, it's pretty scary to others. And I think that it's nice to kind of just talk with them and say, Hey, like, I love what you do. Um, I think it's incredible. And let's, you know, let's talk about it for a minute. If you, if you, if you're keen to that. So I think that's a very nice, good way to go about it. Way of approaching. I mean, we had Katie here in Cape town as, and I had to take her around to a couple of schools and, one thing that, that you'll notice about her and, and, a, and a few of the other astronauts, well, in fact, all of them, uh, they are designed to just be the nicest people. And, and yeah. you know, sometimes people are so surprised that they were down to earth, but, you know, they'll all tell you, listen, I was employed by NASA as an engineer. I just happened to have, you know, gone to space for a while. But when I came back, I'm still an engineer and I'm still working as an engineer and, and that part hasn't changed. You know, I just happen to have a few extra memories and experiences that most people don't get to do. But other than that, I'm still a regular person, which is absolutely awesome. So now, yeah. in, in terms of um, H2M, do you, do you know what, what you're going to be doing there this year? 
Yes, I'm going to be speaking on a social media panel. It's going to be on day three. So it's going to be on the 10th, so the 10th of May. And uh, we're going to be discussing the impact of social media in the science community and why it's important. Um, of course, we'll be talking about Mars um, and why, why we want to go to Mars and why we care. And, and if we would go to Mars, I definitely would, as I was mentioning earlier, um, but a round trip. And, um, and we will be discussing, um, yeah, just overall, like this, the impact of social media, because we're all social media, um, like, uh, because we're like, yeah, we're essentially influencers or we're people that are involved in the social media community. Um, so we do have someone there that actually runs a social media for NASA. Um, we have um, astronaut Abby's mom who's going to be, um, yeah, she's going to be actually narrating and controlling the, the discussion itself, which is going to be pretty cool. And, so, and yeah. She is a social media guru. Well, guru, yeah. and Nicole, they have incredible with the Mars generation um, promotion, they, they, they have incredible systems of, of getting the message out there. So you can learn so much from, from people like that. So when you go there, obviously you're part of the panel, but, but you're also going there to learn. Yeah, so I definitely think, um, as again, I was mentioning, I mean, I'm gonna be doing it virtually. So um, I'm gonna be doing it from my computer, um, but any, like the entire time, I'm just hoping to to really learn also from everyone I will be speaking with. Um, like they'll be on stage, I'll be virtually on stage. Um, and I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be really cool. So I, I'm looking forward to hearing their views as far as um, social media's impact on the science community. And um, also I know there was a, a bit of a dispute, I think it was in Scientific Magazine, um, I forgot which, or Science Mag, I think it was Science Mag, there was like a, an article written about um, like science communicators on Instagram posting pictures about um, them on vacation or something. And I saw that and I was like, well that's interesting and it was like this whole dispute about um, how, uh, it, you know, it's not right that they're doing this. So I'm interested to, to just hear from others, you know, as far as like, why you know social media isn't just about like you know trying to do one thing but it's also about humanizing the person that's behind bringing the knowledge and so i think that each person that's running these accounts that's running their own accounts and talking about science you know it's about the science but it's also about that person and why they care because otherwise you know you're kind of just throwing information at people which people can get from a textbook but what's going to really bring it into their heart is by hearing it from another human being and another person who's experiencing life at the same time. And so I think that's what's really important about um, people that are science communicators that are posting, hey, like, look at this, I'm on vacation, but guess what? I looked up at the stars and I thought about astrophysics or like, you know, or I was looking at the water and I was thinking about all the water molecules that are here and they've been recycled throughout the planet for like decades and centuries. You know, and I, I think that's all hypothetical. I haven't seen anyone post about that. But that's what I would do. And <laughs> so I think that that's, it's humanizing. And again, it's tying science down to earth and into each of our own individual lives. And I think we keep forgetting that. We keep thinking science is like, there and we're here but really science is everywhere simultaneously absolutely yeah. I mean, if you think about it you know some people have got their own personal instagram account and then they have their persona so you might have astro athens as as one but then you might have your very own personal account as well and and if you if you are one character then you might like a certain political comment and then all of a sudden 30 viewers just unlike you because they don't like your political affiliation or you might make a comment or you might share an article that you read but it might have been fake news you know scott kelly uh, his dna is different to his brother you go and share that article and someone goes what kind of scientists are you uh the the media got it wrong and now you're sharing misinformation so so you, there's a lot of um what's what i'm looking for you, you have to be very sensitive to what you share and, and how you share it and to who you share it to, because obviously you have to be aware of the audience uh, that are following you. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that um, one, uh, not mistake or misconception, but I think it, it's necessary. It's something that um, uh, I have noticed before with a lot of influencers that we can even think about, like you mentioned, there was a YouTuber who went to another country and did something like disrespectful and everyone like totally lost their, their mind over it. Um, a lot of the social media influencers and YouTubers are young 
people that um, a lot of times hit it big and aren't really too accustomed to um, experiencing other other cultures or other sensitivities outside of their own friend group or outside of their own um, city or country, wherever it is that they're from. And I think that a lot of times there tends to be this, um, I think that there tends to be like uh, a separation between someone's um, personal views and then what people think their views are. And I think that um, it's super important And when you, because if you talk to any big celebrity like Angelina Jolie, um, or Leonardo DiCaprio, like you, you talk to them, and the reason I use them too as an example is because they they're big advocates for um, a couple different things out there, like Leonardo DiCaprio with uh, NOAA, so National Oceanic Atmos Admir Atm Atmospheric Association, and um, you know, and I think that it reaches a point where they've learned um, where the boundaries are of who's watching them and when people are watching, which essentially is all the time. And I think that people on social media aren't trained mentally just yet because they think, okay, yeah, like I'm on social media, look at how many followers I have, I can post whatever I want and don't care. But at the same time, like there might be a 12 year old girl who looks at that and says, whoa, wait a second, like she's acting like this, I can act like that. And I think that that's what causes a lot of um, the issues like the, we were, you were saying earlier to, to, to tie back into um, the, the Photoshop and the editing a lot of people do to themselves because a lot of times I think we start to forget that um, we have much more of an impact than people just eyeing us and looking at us and saying, wow, yeah, like they're great and this is awesome. But I think that a lot of times there's um, almost like this uh, – this, this, uh, this, yeah, just people forget a lot of times that they're always being watched with what they're doing and what they're saying. And so sometimes if someone says something super negative, super political, you know, there might be people that want to argue back with you and you have to be prepared for that. If you're going to say something, you have to be ready to really truthfully accept um, a, a dispute or discussion in some sort of, in some sort of way. So I've, I've definitely noticed that and learned that. Well, I mean, one thing that always astounds me is that when I'm teaching students in class and I always ask them, do any of you have any idea of what you want to be when you finish school? And I would say that in the past 20 odd years that I've asked that question, the answer have been evolving to the point that if I had to go this week and ask all the kids in class, what would you like to be when you finish school? Do you know what a third of the answers would be? A scientist? A famous Wait. YouTuber. Oh, wow. A third of the kids, they don't want to be a scientist. They don't want to be a doctor. They don't want to be a lawyer. Or uh, Some of them want to be gamers, professional gamers. But a third of them would want to be famous YouTubers. And that is already an indication of the impact that social media has on the younger generation. And I'm talking first and second graders. They are talking about being famous YouTubers. Wow. It's quite simple. That's insane. That's really intense, especially too, because like, you know, like I, they, it's crazy because they're so young and I think that they don't understand like what is happening on the back end with like, like algorithms with what I've heard a lot with like YouTubers. Um, as far as doing like ads and doing all these other things to promote their videos. And um, it's crazy because we're conditioned to think that to be successful in life, you have to have an income and you have to make money because you have to pay bills. And a lot of times people, um, you know, my generation grew up thinking, okay, I need to get my college degree in um, something like um, nursing or something like uh, teaching or business. A lot, like maybe more than 75% of my friends did business management and ended up working for a corporation, which is great. It's their choice. But I think that the thing is we're so conditioned to thinking that we have to graduate and right away go into a job for um, in order to just make money. And, and these kids are seeing that YouTubers make a lot of money. So they say, wow, they're making a lot of money and they're just being stupid. And having fun and being crazy and not all of them are a lot of them are you know literate and doing great amazing things and scientific stuff um but i think that so many times and i do hear it because my little sister is younger too um but just like that age group a lot of times just starts to think like wow like all i have to do is just do something to make it go viral 
And I think that you start to lose the value in growing and learning throughout life as a human being where that's only going to be so finite, you know, like you might hit oh, like a quick viral video by doing something where you might put your life in harm or you might like, you know, totally risk your life jumping off a building and you, you know, like, I, and, and people do this and it's crazy and they truly harm themselves and hurt themselves. And, um, and to me it's, it's, it's crazy because I'm not as exposed to it out here. I mean, there, there's a lot of YouTubers out in LA, but I think a lot of the videos I have been seeing are people, um, a lot of uh, humans that tend to be more central in the United States um, that will do things like um, like shotguns or something and they'll like shoot, shoot, try and shoot each other or something. Like I've seen some really crazy things. And I'm just like, okay, um, you know, it didn't get as many views as they probably hoped for. And now they probably just lost an arm. And, and it just, it's such a bummer because when you're, you're young and you see stuff like that, you think that's the, the way to go where I think that, um, you know, with generic television, like when, um, when we were growing up, we were looking at things on TV where we're like, oh, I want to be that, that, that athlete, or I want to be, um, you know, like that actor or whatever it is, you know? And I think that that's still a very like fantasy type of mentality, but at the same time, you're not necessarily hurting yourself to get there. Well, athletics, that's a different story because maybe you can in gymnastics or, you know, soccer and football and everything like that. Um, but it's just, it's different because that comes through training and hard work for many, many years. And I think um, a lot of the generation is hoping for a quick shortcut to, to success and to fame. And, you know, if it's, if it's going to be a quick shortcut, then that means it's not going to last long either. And they don't realize that, I think. Well, you know, I mean, to the unsophisticated mind, someone who's looking for the number of hits will be prepared to put their body literally on the line. Maybe a, a tape gets released onto the Internet. And bad publicity is also good publicity because it gets people interested in you. And, and yeah. unfortunately, you sell your soul and your integrity for the number of likes. And, and this is another issue that the younger generations struggle with today. They measure their worth by the number of likes they get on Instagram or on Facebook because, or on Musical.ly, whatever it may be that they're using, because that determines how they are valued by their friends. And that's quite a sad uh, indictment on, on teenagers today. Yeah, that's like so sad. And I've actually noticed that too, is it depends on how many likes you get. And um, I mean, we all feel it. Like I've personally felt that before, you know, it's like, I look at it and I'm like, what's wrong with this picture? Why is it not getting as much likes as something else? And if you would detach yourself a little bit from your phone for um, my gosh, like I, I would say a couple hours, but if it, it, you know, and that seems like a long time for people, but if you detach yourself for like a whole day, woo, like it's crazy. I think that you start to really like, you know, realize, wow, there's a whole world out there, you know, outside of, you know, my phone and everything that's on there. And I think it's such a wonderful piece of equipment and there's so much knowledge base in there. I can literally ask Siri to tell me anything in any language I want. And I can learn a language like that if I wanted to, and I can train myself or I could spend hours doing something by, by, you know, like hating myself and looking at pictures of people that I want to look like or whatever it is. Um, and unfortunately a lot of people do that. And that's so bummy to hear because it's like, you know, you're just, you're, you're hurting yourself by doing that. Um, and I think if you would instead look at the, the, the beautiful aspects that there is to offer on a piece of equipment, like a phone or a computer and learning things and, and playing games that like might be a bit educational. Like it's, there's this growth when you start to realize, wow, I memorized this thing and I didn't realize it. Or I understand like why, um, why exactly the, the sky is blue, why the sky looks like that during sunset or different things. And, and at least for me, because I'm such a knowledge based person, I like to constantly learn. Um, I get so excited when I can remember something and, and recite it to people with, with something like that. And I think that um, it comes through through laziness as human beings. We like to be lazy, but when we end up actually being productive, we and then then end up feeling happy, which is really interesting. <laughs> Well, here's a tough question. Uh, I'm going to be in New York on 3rd of July, I think. What are the spacey things that I should know about uh, if I'm visiting the city? Yes. So you should definitely go to the Intrepid because that will be right after Memorial Day weekend. So you might miss Fleet Week um, or you might be right in the middle of Fleet Week, actually. 
Uh, because I think Memorial Day is the 31st. So that would be really fun just because the Intrepid is a giant aircraft carrier. Um, and I know it sounds like totally different because it's military related, but it actually has the space shuttle uh, Enterprise inside of it. So it has a space shuttle pavilion. And they do do on the first, uh, are you, how long are you gonna be there for? Um, I'm literally gonna be there for a day and then I'm off to New Jersey for a bit and then I'll be back in New York again uh, at MoMA doing some, some workshops. But, uh, you know, if you're there, you, you might as well go and I'm not, I'm not even going to see the sites. I'm just going to go and see all the space related uh, things that I can get my eyes on. OK, so if you do want to see the shuttle, I would recommend going to that first thing in the morning because it gets really crowded around noon. So I would go there first. And then if you really want to hit up another museum, head over to the Hay Sanitarium, which is really cool. It's up on 81st Street. So you actually it's on the west side. So you're good. You can just go from one to the other. Um, I would just That's where Neil deGrasse Tyson works. Yeah, he's the director of that. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's it's definitely I'll, I'll really cool. Try and set up a meeting with him. And then um last but not least, uh from a from a, a personal point of view, uh obviously you you value the science, which is very important. You obviously want to communicate that. You also want to model, which some people might say is a, a two opposing forces uh, in, in juxtaposition. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, if you look at uh, not STEM, but STEAM, where you put the arts and the music and the modeling and, and the creativity aspect into the STEM, uh, it's very much something that you can combine together. So what sort of advice would you give young people who are interested in STEM or in the arts or in modeling what advice would you give them uh, to pursue after school from your experience? Would, yeah, yeah. I would say um, if you're really interested in doing something in modeling or acting, look at the different resources um, online as far as like do your research. Um, so doing the research in the industry is super important. Um, like looking at maybe different representation you'd want to do or the different clients you'd want to work for. Um, and then start searching for photographers, start searching um, to do test shoots. And that's both for acting and modeling. If you want to do stuff in, in the fine arts, um, I would look into what's in the neighborhood, like what's close by that you can maybe go to like art galleries or you can go to like crawls. You can meet so many people. It's super important to network. Like I was saying before, like we're all here on this planet together. We're all built to start to know each other and, and build a community together. So I would say in the arts, really start to know the people um, around you and, and surround yourself with those that believe in what you believe and believe in what you want to do because if you're around people that are going and it's hard as an artist like for people to a lot of times will say like oh well that's so short term and why do you really want to do that there's no meaning to it and you know don't spend time trying to convince them spend time trying to be around people who get it and i think that um if you understand why you want to do it that's really the first thing that matters and then find people that support that and find people that also believe that so um, I really think that being around the right people is important. Then the next steps is like, just dive yourself in. Don't have any fear, dive yourself into the industry. Um, jump into like a theater group where you can start like doing plays that on, on the weekends or you start doing um, like theatrics. You can start taking dance classes if you're interested in that or look for a school nearby where you can do like, um, yeah, like a vocal class or even look for places where you can start volunteering. That's what I ended up doing to get back into the science was I started volunteering at the Intrepid. And um, that fortunately got me um, affiliated with all the other museums as well. So I was then able to go to like um, the Smithsonian whenever I went to like DC and I went to um, so many other uh, museums and just being around then those people because they've jumped around from other museums or they've been in other communities um, in the science world too. And so I, I think it really is about just um, being an open person and being confident in what you want to do and what you love. Even if maybe you don't know what you want to do, um, if you know what you love, keep that like in you and then start to strategize. Look at, okay, well, this is what I love. What are the other opportunities I can do with this love? Um, and then what are the things I need to do to get there? And I'm kind of like going downward, but I guess it's more like going upward. Um, and because you know, you, you really need to, in order to be successful in what you're doing. Um, and when I say successful, it means like being able to achieve the greatest level in which you want to achieve in your own life. It, you have to realize like what you have to do as far as the steps to move forward. So, um, 
yeah, that's that's kind of a general um, piece of advice. Specifically, would be like looking at the classes that you would need to take and building up your skill set, and then meeting the people, and then showing them like don't have the confidence. Say like, I know I'm good at this. I know I can recite this play, or I know I'm good at this. I know I can give a lecture on astrophysics or whatever it is. And then when you show that to people, and that confidence comes through, and that passion comes through, it's incredible how many doors will open. So that would be my advice. Sure. <laughs> A wonderful piece of advice. Uh, Govinda, uh, we've got about, we've gone a little bit over time, but maybe you've got a question you want to ask. Uh, you've got a, a young daughter there out in Nepal. I know that um, Effie was was just saying, uh, what did she say before she left? Um, so quickly scroll down here. Uh, she said something to the effect of that, that uh, you would be great. Uh, it, oh, here it goes. It says here, it was delightful watching such a, a lively young woman in action. Keep flying high, Athena. We would love to have you talk to our classes in Greece. And, and she wishes you uh, uh, warm wishes from sunny Greece. Um, but Govinda, would you like to ask a question before we end off? Sometimes it takes a while. Um, <laughs> let's see. That's fine. He's not responding okay. yet. No, OK. So we'll we'll just take it from there. I'm, I'm gonna just say thank you very much for for giving up of your time and for working around the the technical issues. But I, I do think that there's a, a lot more to you than meets the eye. And I think that you know one thing that I've picked up about you is that you take yourself seriously, and and you don't mind what other people think, but you take yourself seriously. And I think that's very important because you obviously are keen to, to head in a certain direction. Go over there. Have you got a question you want to sneak in before we go? You might have just unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Nothing. Oh, you've got no question. Oh, no question. Okay. <laughs> to tell me that you have no question. <laughs> Ah, oh, Govan is very organized. So, um, and I know people watching it live from, from around the world as well. So thank you to those of you that joined us live. And and we wish you all the best in, in the growth in what you're doing, because I think anyone that is promoting uh, space-related uh, topics is, is definitely going to have our support. And, and hopefully, if, if I can connect you with the right people as well, then um, help you to grow your, your network in whatever way we can, because it's all for the course. We're all fighting the, the, the good fight. So yes. thank you so much for giving up your time. I'm going to stop the broadcast over here. Thank you.